I grew up in Boston uh, in the uh, 70s and 80s. Uh, as the child of Indian immigrants, my dad came here in 1959 to get his master's degree in aeronautical engineering at Notre Dame on a scholarship from a small city, in, a small village in India. Then I uh, went back uh, in the 60s, got married to my mom, and then they came back in 67. I was born in 68. And, uh, um, and so, but I grew up uh, as pretty much a standard American. I was playing baseball, basketball. I was the captain of my high school, baseball, basketball, soccer teams, and sports were my way of fitting in. And uh, so I was pretty motivated, but I also, you know, given uh, my parents' background, I, you know, education was always um, a priority as well. So I studied well enough to <laughs> get into MIT. And, uh, um, and so, uh, you know, I, Kiki, what did your what did your parents do before um, before coming to America? Yeah, well, my dad uh, was uh, very academic. He had worked his way from the small village in India to get his master's in aeronautical engineering uh, in India, and then was able to get a scholarship here in the U.S. And my mom also uh, was uh, got a master's in. Uh, uh, chemistry and biology, and then came to the U.S. and got her uh, was became a registered dietitian, uh, and that actually had a big influence uh, on me starting Veggie Grill ultimately because she was always uh, sharing with me how she was helping her patients at the uh, uh, nursing homes and hospitals she was working at help the ones who were willing to try to help uh, help them cure their ailments through food. And she had quite a few success stories. And so I grew up knowing that there was more than just medicine to uh, treat disease, but there was a way to prevent it and cure it through food. And so, uh, um, yeah, but I grew up middle class uh, and uh, with parents who were working hard. And really, I knew that uh, I was going to have to work hard as well to make it because I had no brothers, sisters, no uncles, aunts, grandparents. We were the only ones here in the U.S. And, uh, and my parents had sacrificed a lot to get here. Uh, so I kind of grew up uh, doing paper routes and working the movie theater, whatever I uh, caddying at the, uh, uh, at the uh, country club. Um, so I had my share of uh, jobs to, you know, that kind of, I think, my early entrepreneurial uh, endeavors. And then uh, ended up going to MIT, getting a, uh, a job in computer consulting, but knew I wanted to start my own business. Ultimately, ended up getting my MBA uh, out here on the West Coast at UCLA, and then uh, I really started my first business. So, uh, growing up, it sounds like you kind of had a lot of different things going on. You had academics, you had sports, you had all these other kind of different jobs. Did you? I mean, you said you wanted to kind of have your own business one day. Was that like a vision you had pretty early on or did you have another kind of track that you were on, you know, with school and, and kind of going into like a specific career? Yeah, great question. So um, I really hadn't thought much about uh, what I really wanted to do. Um, and my dad was an engineer. I was pretty good at math. So that's ultimately why I just applied to engineering schools and got into MIT and just kind of went on that track. And, uh, uh, and then I had an intern, I, I pretty quickly realized, you know, I was, engineering wasn't my passion, like it was for a lot of, most people at MIT, I realized. Uh, uh, but at MIT, if you kind of drop out of engineering, you, <laughs> you kind of, it's like you can't cut it. So I stuck with it and uh, ended up getting my engineering degree instead of going into some of the other majors that uh, everybody knows. Well, like you couldn't hack engineering. That's why you changed your major. Um, yeah. Was that something you were, cause, cause both Posh and I have, uh, you know, immigrant parents. So we were both born here, but um, you know, our parents immigrated to the United States and just curious, cause it's kind of different for everybody, but were you, were you pressured at all to go down that track, the engineering track, or did, is that something that you thought you wanted just because, you know, your, your dad was in the space and you thought, Hey, you know, why not, why not give this a try? Um, yeah, good question. I think, uh, I just, uh, in those early days, my job was to kind of go with kind of the standard track, right? Like, Hey, your job is to study hard and Hey, by the way, you know, we've got the, you could play sports if you keep your grades up and that was fun and I was good at it. And, I enjoyed the leadership side of it. So I kind of, 
uh, you know, I saw I had some leadership traits that helped me succeed as, you know, and, and be voted captain of those, each of my high school teams and uh, um, learned some, uh, uh, you know, what it, you know, what you could achieve when you really applied yourself and worked hard, not just at academics, but also at, at, at athletics. And, but the standard track for me seemed like engineering. And so that's what I followed. And uh, uh, but then I kind of started realizing early on at MIT that hey, I'm just this isn't quite you know where I thrive. But I stuck with it, and, and I also played sports, baseball, and basketball at MIT. But uh, my junior year, I worked as a mechanical engineering intern at uh, a corporation, and that was really kind of the where I realized hey, this really just isn't for me. This this to me is not what I want to do. It's just it's a little, for me, it's just not exciting. And uh, so going into my senior year, I knew, hey, I want to try and leverage my tech, technical skills, but really get more on the business side. I kind of say, you know, I was captain of my uh, MIT baseball team as well. I was president of my fraternity. And so, like, I knew I wanted to lead and, and, and kind of manage and create on the front end, not, you know, more on the back end of it. So that's, I think, you know, by my senior year in college, I knew that uh, I wanted to get more on the business side, but I had an engineering degree. And uh, so I, I was able to get a consulting job at a company that was helping businesses uh, figure out how to use technology and computer systems to improve their business. And I had got done some programming at MIT. And so uh, I was able to get a job there based on my uh, programming skills and my technical background. But they also saw that, you know, they were looking for people who could work with uh, uh, the business side of these companies to help them understand what their business needs were and design uh, computer systems to help them solve those uh, problems and be more efficient and be more educated about how to manage their businesses. So I got that job and it was a great experience for me for four years, consulting, working with different businesses and helping to design computer systems. Uh, but then I knew I wanted to get all the way in the front end because I was still designing databases and doing some programming. And I knew, hey, I want to actually build the businesses. And so I, I decided to go get my MIT, uh, my MBA. Uh, at that point, I had moved to L.A. and I knew I didn't want to leave. So I got my MBA at UCLA. And, uh, and I knew, in my mind, the ultimate challenge for me was to start my own business. And I kind of knew that, hey, I know how to work hard. And... Why, I, I want to leverage all of my skills and abilities to their maximum uh, point. And to me, that was uh, starting my own business and controlling my own destiny. And so at that point, that's when I decided to go get my MBA. And, and, and that, the goal of me getting that MBA was to allow myself to uh, look at all the opportunities out there and figure out what to do. And I quickly saw by my second year in business school, the internet was just emerging and I saw um, uh, what was going on there, dove into it a bit and um, ended up starting one of the first e-commerce development firms in the LA area back in 95 with a partner who I had worked with previously. And uh, uh, we, we that company did quite well because we were on the ground floor of the uh, e-commerce and dot-com movement and we, we were powering all these new businesses with their back-end e-commerce engines and uh, mm -hmm. them figure out how to put it all together. And we grew from my partner and I to about 150 people in about five years and you know, raised a bunch of money and you know, had a bunch of dot-coms along with traditional businesses. And, uh, luckily hey, Kim, before, sorry, before you we delve deeper into the uh, business and entrepreneurial journey, I'm curious for a second just about your thoughts and your insight about the journey during your MIT days, during that internship, and kind of the thought process during that time for you, being the child of immigrants, being a child of some or two hardworking parents, you know, was there ever this thought inside you, this desire to please your parents, a desire to make sure that you're not disappointing your parents? I'm just curious because I know a lot of people are, have been or are, in that boat. And I do think that by sharing your thoughts, kind of looking back and what you were going through and how obviously you've come out of that, I think that that will make a huge impact on even one person right now who's in the same boat. 
Yeah, good question. Um, so, uh, you know, my big, I think there's a couple things, uh, a couple different decisions I made along the way that uh, I'm happy I made uh, were when I was working in my consulting uh, career right after uh, undergrad and then decided I wanted to go get my MBA, um, you know, sticking to the high achievement track, I would have applied to the top business schools across the country, like a Harvard Business School or a Stanford Business School. UCLA was you know, top 20 at the time, but you know, certainly Harvard and Stanford carry um, a little higher prestige. And uh, I think my parents would have uh, wanted me to do that. I think that they verbalized that. But in my mind, one, I really thought L.A. was a great home for me. Uh, two, it, I was able to, I knew that um, they had an in-state tuition that was very attractive back in 94, 95. Like, and I knew, hey, I don't want to have any pressure, you know, based on paying a lot for business school, then go get one of the traditional investment banking or consulting jobs and just get on that track. So I want to get, you know, that was my first decision that I'm going to, get off this standard high achievement track that's there. And it's great for people who are really into it and want it and have the ability Hey, you could just keep going down these different tracks. My first step off that track was, hey, I, I've got a base of contacts here in LA. I could start my own business here. I enjoy living here. And UCLA provide, they had a great entrepreneurial program. Uh, and they've got this, you know, basis for me to figure out something different. And so that was the first, you know, thing I did. I said, I'm just going to focus on going to business school at UCLA. And uh, luckily I got in, but, uh, um, and I'm going to focus on leveraging this fact that I get this in-state tuition. I've got a bunch of work contacts around here. I've got all my friends around here after living here four years. So I'm just going to figure it out. I'm going to figure out how to create my own business versus trying to get the highest degree possible and the best job possible. So that was my first step. Yeah. You know, it sounded like from what you said that these leadership sort of skills came pretty natural to you because it was, you know, you're pretty young, like, you know, with I'm sure, you know, with your sports teams and whatnot, being the leader and the captain. At what point, what is your earliest memory, I guess, of you, you know, ex, um, I guess, showing, exhibiting some sort of leadership ability that you can think of? Because I'm sure there are a lot of maybe kids out there that um, have that, but they, you know, m they might not even know it, that they're natural born leaders, I guess, or if you even believe that's even possible. Um, I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on that, uh, about, you know, whether it did come naturally or if it was something that you had to build over time and, and what your earliest kind of memory is of, of being, you know, in a leadership position? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So I think it really did kind of start in high school, right? Where like our, you know, in high school, you know, by your senior year, your, your team, your teammates are voting for their team captain. Right. And that was something I didn't think about. Right. I just, I always applied myself. Uh, and I, you know, I think I certainly, uh, they saw that my work ethic out on the field. I think, you know, they also saw that I really cared about the team and I was always trying to uh, help uh, help my teammates out. And I think maybe even earlier than that, you know, maybe in seventh or eighth grade, I was, uh, you know, always trying to help my friends get better, right? Like we were out there before school taking batting practice and I was really trying to help my friends with, hey, here's, you know, I want you to think about, you know, making sure you keep your, you know, your swing down and your eye on the ball and here's some drills. And I was always, you know, not just focused on myself, but focused on helping my friends get better and my teammates get better. And so I think, you know, those are two things, right? Just my work ethic and my, you know, focus on others uh, in addition to myself that, you know, seemed obviously led to me being voted captain of those three teams. So I think those were traits that, uh, you know, then led to uh, people putting me in those leadership roles based on yeah. those traits. And then you know, I had to kind of then build from there in terms of, hey, you know, I have a responsibility now. Let, let me make sure I deliver on it. And, and was there anyone in particular, whether it was family or people around you or just people that you looked up to that you didn't know, but um, were perhaps famous or, or had been successful that 
maybe kind of helped in that in terms of, um, you know, kind of knowing what to do in scenarios like that. Um, they could have been athletes, they could have been business people. And, and I guess a part of this question is you mentioned kind of wanting to, to have your own business. Like, was there anyone in your childhood that did, or was an entrepreneur that, that you saw, you know, kind of them doing that where you're, you kind of inspired you to want to do that or, or not? Yeah, I think, um, you know, that's where I definitely diverged from my parents, right? My dad worked for the same company for 30 years and got a pension. And, uh, um, but he took a huge risk. <laughs> he took a, you know, he took a cargo ship for 30 days because that's all he could afford to get from India to the U.S. to go get his, uh, you know, uh, second master's in aeronautical engineering, you know, and he took a ship, got to New York City. And then uh, uh, went to the YMCA and asked him how to get to South Bend, Indiana. And they told him what bus to take. And he took that bus and like, right. I mean, that's, that's amazing. I can think about that now. It's amazing, right? Uh, the, the risk he took. So, but once he took that risk, that whole risk was because, you know, he needed to then generate a stable income and a career. And so, you know, that his risk of that and then creating that stability, then I think, provided the foundation for me to then take my risk, right? So, okay, well, my parent at a certain point, I didn't have debt with college, right? Because they, they, they did their job, you know, from a middle-class perspective, what they felt their job was, was to make sure I got through my college without debt. And, and then, uh, so they gave me this foundation. And then obviously I grew up in this country. And so, you know, I had a little bit more confidence in being able to lead and do things and, um, so I think they put me in this position to maximize my, my own abilities. Uh, TK, I'm I, curious. I know, I know a lot of entrepreneurs and leaders in general, you know, that we've spoken to, or just that people generally just read about have also had a lot of failures early on that have made a big influence, you know, in their lives later, um, you know, and have been almost the reason for, or the purpose for them wanting to become entrepreneurs. Were there any such failures or challenges in, you know, your childhood, high school or college years that, you know, made an impact on you and that you were able to overcome and then has made you now a better leader, a better founder? Um, well, I'd say, you know, one of my, my growing up, right, one, as we mentioned, I was a child of immigrants. So I was the only Indian kid growing up in my neighborhood in Boston. Um, and two, I was skinny, right? You know, I'm only a buck 50 now. And I was even skinnier back then. Um, and so, like, I, you know, I was like the skinny Indian kid um, that was different. And uh, sports was, uh, look, I had, I was pretty athletic, co you know, coordination-wise and had enough skills to uh, kind of, you know, be, be that uh, leader of my high school teams. But I had to work really hard. Like I felt I really had to work really hard because I just wasn't as big and strong as most people around me, right? And uh, so I had to make up for it with effort and practice. And, uh, and I just really, that was my way to fit in. And uh, so I think I learned, you know, through that perseverance of, hey, the skinny Indian kid can still be the captain of his baseball team and basketball team. Just really achieve pretty, like I just learned how to work my ass off and, uh, you know, based on a goal that I had and a chip that I had on my shoulder. And so I think that's really paid off, right? And then and then I would say MIT, man, that, that, that's, uh, I was overloaded. Like I said, like that wasn't, you know, engineering was not my thing. And I got there and you're with the, you know, the smartest technology, you know, most talented uh, tech uh, tech people in the country. And I got my ass really handed to me freshman year and sophomore year. And Did you I feel really, like an imposter almost? Like, have, like, did you have like imposter syndrome being there? It was just hard. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> really hard. And like, but, uh, you know, I was like, but I like, I figured it out. I was like, I had to step it up. It was, like, it was almost like mental boot camp for me. I like guess to me, like people talk about the Marines and never want to do it again, but you're glad you did it. That was MIT for me. Like I, I never want to do that again. Like I was playing baseball games with two hours sleep and, you know, going all nighters and basketball games the next day. And I was, it was 
it could wear you down and break you down. But like I always said, I'm not going to give, I'm not going to give up. I'm going to, I'm not going to not play baseball or basketball because that's my sanity. And I'm going to just figure out, you know, I just made it through and figure out how to, you know, just amp my game up. And so th those were a couple things that really formed my confidence today. Where I was like, yeah, I, you know, it's just up to me. Like I, you know, I just got to apply myself and, you know, I th and I'm going to leave it all on the court or all in the business uh, field and whatever happens, happens. But I have confidence that if I put my best uh, effort forward, you know, hopefully good things will happen. Yeah, you talk about, um, or I guess, the moment where you kind of realized that engineering track, the engineering track wasn't right for you, wanted to go into business. Um, it's it obviously such, it, it, it obviously such a pretty vague kind of thing, you know, going into business because you can do anything, right? There's so many different, you know, ideas out there, so many different industries. How did you kind of land on, um, you mentioned, you know, the dot com boom and kind of what was happening at the time, but like, what, uh, how did you decide what route you wanted to take when it came to business? Yeah, so I think the first step, and this is what I tell all uh, wannabe entrepreneurs, is I started looking. Like I started like because freshman year or first year in business school, it's easy to get caught up on a track there too. There, you know, everybody starts looking for their summer internships, and they're interviewing with the consulting companies and the investment banks and the marketing, uh, you know, large uh, marketing departments of big brands and. Uh, you know, it was tempting. I was like, oh, well, maybe I should do that. That sounds kind of glamorous and easy way, you know, be set after graduation. Uh, and I went to one interview and then really realized, hey, this is not what I want to do. I'm here to figure out a business. And so I'm, I decided to not focus on any of those standard career uh, paths. And so I started looking and I, yeah, I looked, you know, this was 1995, 94, 95 was my first year. And uh, this outsourced programming in India was just starting to emerge. So I was like, well, you know, that seems interesting. And I got an Indian background. I got contacts in India. Uh, I'm going to go to India for the summer between my first and second year and figure out what's going on. Like if I can actually create a business based, you know, helping to basically, the, I had this idea of offshore programming, which I, uh, obviously is a big business now. It's just emerging back then. And, you know, there was a few, people here and there doing it. And I was like, yeah, this, this makes sense. And I could help make it happen. I got a technical background and uh, help, you know, figure out, get some good uh, contacts in India and then come back to the U S and create this off, you know, offshore programming business. So that was, and I went to India and I started looking at that and met with a lot of people. And so that was my first idea. And, um, and I went after it and probably could have made it happen. But then I got back uh, my second year, um, fall of 1995, and uh, uh, my roommate, uh, who I'd worked with previously and also went to MIT, said, hey, have you been on the internet? I was like, uh, yeah, nah, no, I haven't. He's like, oh, you should get on there. It's pretty awesome. I was like, yeah, yeah, Joe, I'm not a tech guy anymore. I'm a business guy. Yeah, I'm sure it's good for you. Um, but then, like, uh, you know, a couple weeks later, I got on there, and I started learning about it. And I was like, this, this is perfect. I went back to Joe. I was like, wow, you're right. The internet is pretty amazing. And, you know, then one thing led to another. I actually did an internship, again, with me trying to figure out what to do. I, I got an internship with uh, a private equity firm because, again, like, yeah, these guys are investing in different companies. It'd be great for me to learn a little bit more about that. Um, so, I, uh, and they they looked at me and said, yeah, you know, we could do a little project. You know, we're trying to figure out what to do with the internet. You got a tech background. Why don't you help us figure out that? And, and then we'll, if you help us do that, we'll put you on some of our business deals and you can get a little exposure to kind of what we look for in, in businesses. So I was like, okay, yeah, that sounds good. So I dove in and started diving into the internet and how, how this invest, this private equity firm could uh, leverage it. And that's when I, I went to a conference and about, uh, and, and then I went to that conference and like there, we had, there was like, it was the early, early phase of the internet and people teaching uh, you what the internet was, how to use it. And that's all, that's what Joe and I had done in our, you know, in our, when we were working for our consulting firm, we taught companies how to use technology. And, uh, and I, and I went back to Joe, I was like, yeah, we could do a better job running this conference and, you know, we could do this ourselves. And Joe was like, well, let's do it. So he and Joe actually had started his own, uh, consulting company. 
uh, to do it, you know, and he's like, yeah, let's do it. And he was really entrepreneurial too. So he's all right, let's, yeah, we're going to do it. My, I get my, I get done with my fall semester on December 11th and December 12th, we're going to meet and figure out how to run our own internet conference, uh, in 1995. And so we did that. And so we dove in and we started, you know, doing all the research on the internet and then we're diving into it. It's like, oh, you know, there's, you know, we could do a yellow pages, we could do a toy shop, you know, we could do the, all these things. And we kind of, looked at all these different things, we ended up coming up with the fact that, hey, we could actually help all these businesses create their e-commerce sites. And we know how to do that you know, because, because that's what we had done but with different technologies. And we could, and it, it makes a lot of sense for all these businesses to you know, put their catalogs online. It's a way for them to do it better, faster, cheaper. They don't have to publish their catalogs. They can they take orders 24 seven. So net, net, we, we went for it and we figured this out. And then I was like, my, by my second uh, semester, second year of business school, I was like, we're, we're doing this. And, and I, I took marketing class, business plan class. And I was the front end of the business. Joe was kind of figuring out more of the technology piece of it. I was figuring out what, how do we get our first clients? And I was leveraging every contact I could at business school to help figure out, you know, talk to these potential clients, learn what their pain points were, figure out how we could get some early, uh, early uh, tests and uh, um, and so it uh, it we it ended up becoming a big business right but it all started with looking and trying to figure it out and then once we saw something once I saw something I thought made sense going after it did you guys end up selling that business yeah so what happened is as I mentioned we grew really rapidly uh, during that first phase of the dot-com boom and uh, we ended up raising a lot of money. We raised $40 million at, right at the end of 1999 and luckily sold a piece of the company uh, at the time, a third of the company. So we were able to sell some of our equity and, uh, and then kept managing the business. But then uh, uh, we hit the down uh, the downturn and uh, we learned some hard lessons. Like we learned a lot of lessons building that company really rapidly. And then we had to figure out how to resize it and restructure it uh, when uh, when we hit that uh, uh, dot com crash and lost half our clients because they went out of business, and so we had to uh, lay off a bunch of people, get back to profitability. We ended up buying our investors out because what they had invested in and the opportunity for us to go public no longer existed. So we ended up doing that and uh, getting our business back to profitability. And by two thousand four, you know, Joe and I both kind of said, "Hey, you know, we've kind of done." We've, really, we've done what we really enjoy, which is building great business. We've got it back to profitability. We've cashed out a bit. You know, we're, we were both ready to kind of move on to our next ventures. And so we ended up taking the team beneath us and giving them the opportunity to run the company. And so we did that. Uh, we stepped away from day to day. They did a great job taking, you know, continue to run the, the, that business and build new clients and, uh, and it had become more of a more tech consulting business versus the e-commerce uh, uh, building business that uh, it was in its first phase. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, and then we ultimately, uh, the people who we had put in charge ultimately bought, a, bought, bought us out completely. And uh, so that all happened in 2004 and that gave me a blank slate because I had stepped mm -hmm. away and uh, 2005 is when I started my journey that ended up uh, resulting in starting Veggie Grill. Yeah, and before we talk about um, Veggie Grill, you mentioned some of the lessons that you learned during that time, um, you know, during the dot-com bubble bursting and, and kind of being in that position. Uh, what were some of those biggest takeaways as a business owner during that time and, an, you know, a founder of a tech company that you can share? Because, you know, we see... A lot of cycles, right? But you know, perhaps an economic downturn coming these days. We see a lot of layoffs, and hopefully, it's not as bad as it was back then. But um, just kind of curious, uh, what your thoughts are, if you could share there. Sure. Uh, so, I think the biggest um, lesson, or you know, I take with me, has really served served uh, me well. Uh, starting uh, both Veggie Grill and Power Plant Ventures, and uh, was. Right when things were starting to go south with the dot com boom, uh, I read a book called Built to Last and uh, by Jim Collins, and uh, he had a subsequent book called Good to Great. But it really dove into purpose, uh, values, and vision, and really, uh, and 
how to create a sustainable company by making sure you you have a team that's aligned around that purpose, values, and vision. And we 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 took that framework to heart at Guidance, the technology company, and, and we dove in and we did that in 2000. You know, and that that served us well. We're like, okay, what is what are we really passionate about? What do we want to do? What because we're gonna have to make some choices. We can't do it all, right? Because we were doing it all when the dot com bubble was continuing to grow and everybody wanted us to do everything and we, you know, there was no end in sight. And we just kept building these new pieces of the business, hiring different uh, skill sets and, you know, we said, okay, what's, what is our core purpose? Um, what are our values? What is our vision for the future? And that guided all those decisions around, okay, how are we going to restructure the business? Uh, because it's just like, hey, what, what do we really want to do? And what, who are, and luckily Joe and I and our, other partners, we, we did share some common values and uh, uh, we're able to align. Uh, but what happens a lot uh, is people don't aren't aligned around purpose, vision, values. And when you hit tough times, you, you, you just you're not able to agree on things. And then that's what rips partnerships apart. And I've seen it. Um, and uh, uh, so I took that same framework uh, into Veggie Grill before we started. Before we even partnered, I, I sat down with my partner, Kevin, who I started Veggie Grow with and said, okay, well, let's figure out you know, what is, the, here's what I think a purpose, vision, and values could be. What do you think? And we hashed through that and got to some common language and saw that we, you know, we had a similar vision and we had values that we agreed upon. And, uh, and then Ray, our third partner, you know, we presented that to him before he joined. And he, you know, like, this is what we're trying to do. This is what we stand for. Uh, we'd love for you to be part of it. And, 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 you know, we kind of really understood each other, right? So that to me is the foundation of any great partnership, any great business is a clear understanding of what your, what your purpose, values, and vision are. And TK, just to take that one step further, and I'm curious, obviously, to hear your thoughts on this as well. I think, and I 100% agree with, you know, the purpose, the value the vision for a company. But I also think that what's important is your personal purpose and vision and values, right? Mm-hmm. And I do think that doesn't mean necessarily it has to be aligned with the company's, you know, let's call them PVV since we keep saying the same words over and over again. But what were your personal values in that, or excuse me, and, and your personal vision during the time that you were starting Veggie Grill? Yeah, good question. So, um, you know, that goes back to a little bit about, you know, my childhood, right? And, and like I, you know, the slate was blank, right? Because I had stepped away from uh, guidance and, but I had this deep technical background, right? And a lot of experience building a tech company. And um, so that seemed like the standard track, right? Let, you know, figure out the next tech endeavor to get involved with. And I started looking at a few different ones. But, you know, I, I started reading about um, uh, what was going on with health and wellness in the U.S. and just the rates of diabetes and heart disease and healthcare costs and dependence on pharmaceuticals. And through my upbringing and my mom's foodist medicine background and teachings to me, I was like, yeah, I know there's a better way, right? And I want to be part of that. Like, I wanted like that to me, like, I didn't quite... Uh, articulated at the time but i have since is that really was a calling for me it's like yeah i i can really you know i grew up in american culture but i understand eastern culture as well and really believe in you know this ability to marry the best of eastern and western cultures and i was like well you know that's what i want to do right and um so i want to try and create a business that helps take the country in the right direction around health and wellness and food. And so that was the initial inspiration and kind of, but it went deep into my own, you know, upbringing and what I was passionate about, what I thought, you know, it's, I I didn't say at the time, but it's a framework from good to great, like what I could be the best in the world at, right? Merging those two things. And, um, and then I, you know, I dove into it. I started looking at, well, where, where could it be and what's happening? And it kind of, I read this article in the LA Business Journal, and that um, showed the top ten franchisees in LA County, right? And they were all uh, burger places and pizza places. And I was like, you know, it's got to be something better, 
right? I was like, that, that was a light bulb. It's like, well, can't there be something that's healthy, delicious, and convenient? Right. And I ate out a lot and I could never find something I enjoyed. And eating out was such a key part of American culture. You know, how, that seems like a fundamental need and opportunity that's not being met. And I wonder if I could solve that problem. And so that, um, you know, that, and I, and I played around with it. Like I actually it was a friend of mine who had a restaurant concept. I was like, Hey, can we make that healthy, convenient, delicious? He's like, yeah, I think we could. And so we dove into it, but one thing led to another and we, we didn't align on exactly how a partnership could work and what we we're trying to do. And so we decided to part ways and, you know, it just left a little hole in me. I was like, man, I was really excited about that, but eh, I guess that's not going to happen. And I started looking at other things again, but then I actually uh, met my veggie grill co-founder, Kevin, for a breakfast meeting because he was an investment banker who I had known from my internet days. And he was looking at a tech deal and I joined him to evaluate that tech deal. And um, he, uh, we both weren't, you know, I was going to help him. Yeah. And then we both weren't excited about it, but we sat down for coffee afterwards. And uh, and he was like, well, what else are you thinking about? And I said, yeah, you know, I kind of, hesitantly said, well, I'm thinking about, you know, this idea about healthy, delicious, convenient food. I think there's a big need for it. And, um, and I didn't know it at the time, but he was a consumer who was really health focused and really struggled to eat out as well. And he's like, yeah, I think that's, that's interesting. I'd be really interested to dive in further with you. And that's all I needed to hear. Like I dove right back in and started to figure out, well, how, you know, it does healthy, convenient, delicious food. You know, do people want it? Does it exist? How can we make it uh, happen? And so dove in, but you know, it kind of came to that original passion. TK, I'm interested because I was doing a little bit of research before, obviously having this conversation. And the one thing I was looking up is when some of all when all of these healthier alternative fast casual concepts came to be. And I was looking up obviously veggie grill, and I looked up sweet green and tender greens. And it was interesting that they all started, and all three of you guys from the three that came to mind, in like late 2006, early 2007. Mm -hmm. What the hell was going on during 2006, 2007 that three different companies, all with, I would assume, some sort of a similar goal of having a healthier option in the marketplace started? Yeah, I think, uh, good question. I think it's because uh, people were just starting to open their eyes. Um, Fast Food Nation had just come out in 2000 four or five, um, and Super Size Me. So Fast Food Nation was a book, Super Size Me was a documentary. Um, and, uh, and people were seeing like, man, our food like is just not good. <laughs> like the, what they're serving us in the, it's, it, it is actually terrible, right? Like people start realizing that. And, uh, and then Whole Foods uh, and the organic foods market was just starting to hit their uh, real growth spurt. Whole Foods was growing 20% year over year. And this was all data I looked into because my first step was, hey, I want healthy, delicious, convenient food. Do other people want it? And so the, all these, these are all data points that were part of my research. And I think uh, one of the um, investment banks or like Merrill Lynch had done a survey and 75% of consumers weren't happy with their fast food choices. So there was definitely this bubbling desire for People didn't want to give up convenience and taste, but they wanted health. And so that's, I think, we, we, we saw that opportunity to fill that need, and so did a few others when we did it in slightly different ways. But like you said, yeah. we were all trying to create better food that was still convenient. Yeah. Um, obviously, Veggie Grill was such a different business than um, what you were doing before. How did you even figure out the kind of first few steps of getting it going, you know, finding the vendors, coming up with the food options, uh, you know, kind of really building out the operations. And I saw that I think the first location was in Irvine in California, like finding the location, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think one of the key definitions of an entrepreneur is putting all the pieces together and figuring out how to bring all those resources together in the right way. Um, and uh, so, I think, um, you know, between Kevin and I originally, we kind of, we both had different business experiences we were successful with, and we had some capital that we could um, leverage to focus on this next endeavor. Um, you know, I had had some exposure to consumer 
the consumer side of things through uh, guidance and helping these online brands get launched uh, from an e-commerce perspective. Uh, and Kevin had, you know, more of a financing uh, background, and uh, but we had zero restaurant experience. So we knew we had to find that. And so we basically went, you know, went out searching for a great restaurant operating partner. And, um, and we like went to every, and through our research, we were, you know, you know, I, when we, went out to solve this problem of healthy, delicious, convenient food. I went and visited every healthy restaurant I could find just to see it doesn't exist, right? And it really was a pie in the sky idea because I had zero restaurant experience. Uh, but I was like, well, let me just see if it exists. And so um, found this kind of small whole new all vegan restaurant and uh, along with, you know, tried several others, but this one's like, wow, this food's actually good. Like this, this vegan food, when it's, prepared the right way can actually be really satisfying, really filling, but also convenient. And, and I assume it's healthy. And I was like, wow, that was a light bulb. Cause before that, I didn't even know if I could create it. I was like, wow, this, this could be the answer. And next thing I did was I dove into, okay, is vegan food really healthier? And this 2005 studies were just starting to come out, presenting some pretty compelling data around the benefits of plant-based foods, which are now a lot more prevalent and a lot more people, uh, are, are on board with, but back then it was early and I didn't even know. And I was like, wow, this is pretty compelling data. Like, you know, the, the reduction in your risk of heart disease and several cancers and obesity. So I, I, I dove in and became a plant-based eater and, and I had great results. I lost 20 pounds. My cholesterol went from over 200 to under 140. It just felt great. It just worked for me. And so like, that was a second light bulb. I was like, wow, this, this really is you know, a, a really healthy way to eat and it works. And so this could really solve this problem. Um, and then I actually brought a bunch of people, you know, friends who were in that similar demo that I was in, you know, so I just want healthy, delicious food. I'm in my mid to late thirties. I'm willing to pay a little bit more for it and said, Hey, am I fooling myself? Does this food taste great? You know, and I was, I was vegan for a few months at the time. And they're like, yeah, well, it actually tastes great. You know, and I would eat this a couple of times a, um, a week, but you know, it just kind of feels like I have to be a vegan to walk in here and just feels like, you know, you have to sign a petition and do the downward dog. And that was like the third light bulb. It's like, wow, if you could make this fun, friendly, approachable, uh, this could, you know, really, you know, take this niche food to a lot more people. Right. And so I get like progressively more and more excited about this. And Kevin, I, you know, I was working with Kevin and he was getting excited too. And, and we're like, okay, you know, we're going to do this, but we're going to go. And the first thing we did is we went and approached the, you know, the owners of this vegan restaurant uh, and said, hey, we want to invest in your restaurant, help you grow. And we'll bring the capital. We'll bring some of the experience around it, helping you grow a brand and grow a business. And you just, you know, you guys know how to create this great food. And, you know, we want to brand it and package it differently. And we want to invest and help you grow because we like, we don't know how to run restaurants. Right. So that was the first uh piece of uh, process or a step. And then what we found out is the owners of the, the restaurant didn't get along. They weren't working well together and they were trying to figure out how to split apart. And we looked at maybe buying one of them out and partnering with the other. And then we realized, and we had defined kind of our purpose, values, and vision. And we saw that they were not quite aligned on what the vision and values of what we're trying to do are. So that's not going to work. But then we went back to the other partner and said, hey, we're not going to buy you out, but we're doing this and we need a, a third partner who can really bring the restaurant to life and you know how to do that and we'll put all the capital in and you just do what you know how to do, create great, uh, a great restaurant and a great menu. And, uh, and like I said, we aligned on the purpose, the vision, the values, and he jumped on board. And so between Kevin, Ray, and I, we had you know, shared uh, vision but then really complementary skill sets. Like we, you know, and we put them all together and then Ray, we brought a fourth, our first hire was a director of operations because Ray said, Hey, well, I know how to create a great menu, but we know you need somebody who can run, run the front end, the front end of the restaurants and all the operations. And so we brought on a director of operations. And so between the four of us, we all had uh, different pieces of creating a great restaurant company that we handled, put them all together and uh, it worked. So, so, but you know, it took a lot of work and I was still amazed that I run a restaurant company given my lack of ability in the kitchen, but it's about bringing the right people in and, you know, being self-aware and understanding what you're great at and what you need help at and making sure you 
bring those people in with the right skill sets, but really aligned around that vision and values. And, and you talk about, um, you know, kind of reading Jim, Jim Collins and kind of learning about scalability of a business and all that kind of stuff. Was the vision early on when you were starting Veggie Grill, um, kind of just to start with one restaurant and really operate it really well, see how it does and just kind of slowly grow from there? Or were you thinking like, let's go big, let's start franchising ASAP, let's, you know, let's, let's really get it to like a massive scale that's like all over the country. Like how was, what, how are you kind of approaching this kind of business that was so different than like a tech company, you know? Sure, sure. Well, the, the, the vision was always, hey, we want to change American food culture for the better. And we're, we're, to do that, you need more than one restaurant. So, so the vision, and that was part of the original, uh, you know, what I was looking at when I was looking at these restaurants, uh, doing my research, this can't just be a chef driven high end restaurant, um, that's doing, you know, a different menu every day. Like this needs to be scalable. Right. That was one of my mm-hmm. filters. So we always want to create a scalable business where we could bring healthy, delicious, convenient food to across the country. So that was the vision, but you had to start with one, right? You have to, you know, every business has to have its early proof of concept. And that's in the restaurant world, that's your first restaurant. You got to make sure that works. So, you know, it's kind of both pieces were there. Yeah. It's been 15, 16 years now. Do you feel as though American food culture is changing? Yes, it is. Um, it's amazing how far we've come. You know, when we started in 2005 or 2006 is when we launched, um, you know, one, we we're trying to, you know, help people understand that plant-based food was healthy and that you could, you know, get all the nutrients you need. Now, you know, based on all the different books and studies and documentaries, people understand that, you know, hey, plant-based food is healthy and uh, helps you avoid a lot of the uh, negative uh, impacts that cholesterol, like cholesterol and saturated animal fat, and all these things. So, it, it, you know, now even cardiologists are recommending to their patients go vegan. That was not happening in 2006. Um, two, you know, it's pretty clear people understand uh, the factory farming impacts to the environment, which I learned early on back in 2005 when I did some reading and that also cemented my passion for starting veggie grill was seeing what factory farms were doing both to the, to the environment and to the animals, people, you know, more and more people understand the environmental side for sure. Right. And so, uh, you know, you see it every day, Hey, you know, try to reduce your meat, try to eat, you know, in a way that's not going to destroy the planet. And, um, and then three, the products, right? Like when we started veggie grill, we were making our own, tempeh and making our own what we called wheat meat or seitan and uh, uh, making it in our kitchens and there's one company that just started with a chicken product that we uh, came out right before we opened our first location so we used that and uh, now you know we have suppliers knocking on our door every day with great new meat alternatives that are solving different problems in different ways um, so you know, the demand from the consumer side is there. The entrepreneurs continue to innovate. Uh, you know, so we just need to keep moving it quicker and faster and making it easier and easier for more people to eat uh, eat plant-based and uh, not support factory farming, which really is destroying the planet. How long did it take um, until you started expanding from that first location into, you know, two, three, four, five and more locations? And what were maybe some of those early maybe challenges that, you guys faced with with the expansion if, if any sure um so luckily the first location worked pretty well off the bat right like we were right across from uci and right next to a trader joe's and we you know we, in our early you know planning we said yeah we know our consumer is going to trader joe's and whole foods so let's find it. we had a map of every trader joe's and whole foods in southern california and Find a location is not easy when you're starting your first restaurant. So we like, but we, through a lot of hard work, were able to convince a landlord of that location, which wasn't a traditionally successful restaurant location, to let us take over that lease. And we, even though it wasn't a great location, we're like, yeah, it's next to Trader Joe's, it's across from UCI. These are two good markets for us. And, and we got a lot of foot traffic and people, and luckily we kind of came to market with the right brand and right menu that the whole goal was people would look at it and say, yeah, it looks good. I'll give it a try. 
and, and that worried people gave us a try. Like, well, that's great. And then they told their friends. That's how we built the first uh, first uh, restaurant, and, and it worked great. Uh, we opened our second location, and, was, and so that gave us the wherewithal to say, okay, let's get the second one open. We opened the first one in November of 2006. We signed a lease, I think, about uh, uh, maybe six months later by, um, you know, for our second location. And, uh, and, but, and we got that and we had to work hard to get that second lease, but we were, you know, it was here in El Segundo where a new Whole Foods was getting built and we had to convince the landlord that we had something that was worth putting in there. And, uh, but we, we were able to do that pitching and got him to visit our Irvine location. And, you know, but what happened is like, yeah, he said, yeah, we could fit you in, but you know, this is the location we have, which was like the edge of this new center that was being developed with zero foot traffic, zero visibility. And, but we're like, yeah, we'll take it because, <laughs> you know, that's what happens when you're starting early and just trying to claw your way up. And so we took it and uh, we opened it in January, 2008, 13 months later. And uh, it was in this back half of this third piece of the center where Whole Foods was uh, probably about a um, five minute walk, you know, was yeah, just maybe a couple hundred yards away, but you couldn't see veggie grow from there. And this third piece of the center wasn't even built out yet. So nobody knew there was anything back there and there was zero foot traffic. And so we opened the doors and nobody was there. Right? That, that first couple of weeks, it was empty. And we we're like, gosh, we, you know, this, we screwed this one up. And we had capital for two, you know, two more locations, you know, that one and the third one. So, you know, we're, we're gonna have to make the third one work because this one's not looking good. Uh, but, you know, we, we kind of just kept working on you know, how do we get people to know about us back here? And we just, you know, we started focusing on all the companies that were in the offices nearby and started providing free food and, you know, and, you know giving them free catering and cards to then come in for a free meal. And we just, you know, just through, through every, you know, a lot of on the ground grassroots marketing got more people to give us a try. And then, and then they started spreading the word. and. By April or May, we were doing more than we were in Irvine. So at that point, we were like, well, we, we have a concept that works because we're in like this place where you can't even see us, no foot traffic, and, and but people are coming in because they really want healthy, delicious, convenient food, and, and we're doing it. And uh, so that's when we said, then we, yeah, we started stepping on the gas. But there was, there was a good couple months there where I was like, man, this, this, this is not working. <laughs> and, and how many locations are there now? Uh, 33. 33. Um, and so speaking of like, you know, kind of future plans from here, um, you know, we see so many kind of restaurant concepts come in, really kind of hit this stride and then perhaps get, you know, acquired by some bigger, you know, conglomerate of restaurant brands, or they maybe go the franchise model, or they just stay private and kind of just grow that way, like the in and out you know, in and out folks and, and kind of that route. Do you kind of, what are the plans in your, with your vision for, for Veggie Grill from here on out? Yeah, well, we have a big vision, right, which is to yeah. continue to change American food culture for the better. It's changed a lot, but there's a lot left, right? There's still right. a lot of, uh, you know, there's just right now we're destroying our planet based on our food choices, right? And, hey, you can't change. And, and so we need to show them that you can have just as much enjoyment and get everything you want, you know, when you go to one of our uh, restaurants, whether it's Veggie Grill or Stand Up Burgers or our third brand, Moss Veggies, and we've got a few other brands. So we're still on a, a really, we're passionate about bringing our concepts across the country. And, and ultimately, you know, we, we probably want to go public, you know, in a couple of years. That's our plan. And uh, um, so we're doing everything we can to continue to grow and be ready because that's how we think we can make the biggest impact, right? We don't, you know, hey, if the right company, parent company wants to acquire us and we think they share the purpose, mission, and values and they'll help us get there faster, absolutely, we'll look at it. Uh, right. But, you know, it's got to be the right partner. And we're, we're, in such, we're so passionate about our vision and purpose that, uh, you know, I think the first choice would be to just keep going on our own so that we, nobody's going to screw it up. Mm -hmm. Tiki, I'm curious about one thing. So, there's obviously several different kinds of founders and there's never one linear singular path to becoming a founder or starting something and making it successful. But in your case, as a two-time founder of two successful companies, 
which one was harder? The first one where you had more of a chip on your shoulder, you needed to make money, I assume, versus the second one where you had made money and now you're trying to fulfill a personal and a corporate, let's call it purpose, a corporate vision and solve, a, in my opinion, much bigger problem. Yeah, um, good question. Um, and uh, I'd say uh, the second one for sure, because to your point, it's a, like something I had never done before. Like the first one, it looked like looking back, it was kind of like a layup, right? Not a layup, but hey, like it's a business I knew. You know, Joe and I both had done the same thing at another company previously, but now we're doing it, uh, for, you know, with our own company and we had enough of the leadership skills and, and we're, we had identified this new technology and new opportunity to leverage these skills and, uh, and we were able to bootstrap it too, right? Like we needed a lot of capital, right? Because you can program the solutions and you're not, you don't have to build a million dollar restaurant before you find out if it works. You go sell sell the solution and then you build it, right? And so um, uh, certainly, uh, you know, yeah, so we learned some hard lessons like the dot-com bust, right? That was the hard part of the first company. But until then, it was, you know, everything kind of worked because we yeah. kind of knew what we were doing. We were in our sweet spot. Uh, and uh, uh, whereas the second one, like I figure out a lot, right? A lot of new things, put a lot of capital in. And, um, and we're still... You know, selling food and trying to change American food culture, to your point, is harder than uh, uh, showing people how great e-commerce can be for their business. <laughs> it's just harder. Yep. yep. Yeah, it's a, it's a big shift in consumer behavior for sure. But uh, yeah, I think we're good. Yeah, I, TK, I, you know, this has been such a pleasure. Um, you know, we can't thank you enough for coming here and hanging out with us and, um, you know, sharing your story, but also all the kind of takeaways and lessons learned along the way. And, uh, you know, can't wait to see how things go from here on out with you and with veggie grill and, uh, looking forward to keeping in touch and, and, um, yeah, it's been a pleasure. Well, great. Yeah, it was great. Time flew by and yeah, get yourself into a veggie grill or stand up burgers or order moss veggies for takeout and delivery and, you know, just see how great our food is. Yeah, and it's in LA. Uh, where else? Sorry, California. What other uh, states is it in at the moment? Yeah, we're in Seattle, uh, Portland, uh, Northern Cal, Southern Cal, uh, Chicago, Stand Up Burgers, uh, Boston, New York, Veggie Grill. And, uh, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, TK. Awesome, TK. Yep. Thank you.